<clears throat> uh, right. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to have Professor Andrew Sharman of RMS Switzerland, who has kindly agreed to deliver this session today. Um, we also have Alison Hind joining us from uh, who, uh, who looked after the IR Swiss network. Um, so I'm shortly going to hand you over to Alison, who will give a short introduction. Uh, before I hand you over, I just want to mention a few things. Um, so firstly, for those of you who haven't attended one of our IASH webinars, my name is Ben Pollard, uh, and I'll be taking care of the technical aspects uh, of today's webinar. Uh, so any problems, and I will try to assist as best as I can. So uh, on your screen then, uh, at the top left-hand side, uh, you should notice a small bar with some written options on them, which are chat and Q&A. Uh, if you have any technical issues or audio problems uh, at all, and you need to message me at any point, uh, please use the chat option. Um, and you can ask uh, uh, any questions you have there and I'll be able to answer. Uh, if you have any specific questions for Andrew uh, relating to the actual content of today's session, uh, you can ask those in the Q&A option. <clears throat> uh, at the end of Andrew's presentation, uh, we will then run through all of those questions uh, that have come through in, um, come in throughout the session. Uh, if for any reason we run out of time uh, and there are still unanswered questions remaining, uh, we'll review these at a later stage uh, with the intention of posting some written answers um, following the webinar. Uh, so finally, just so that you are all aware, the session is being recorded for future playback. So uh, with all that said, I'll now hand you over to Alison, uh, and I hope that you all enjoy the session. So Alison, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this IOSH Swiss Network uh, webinar, particularly welcome to Andrew Sharman, who's presenting for us this morning. I just wanted to take a few minutes to look at what um, we have planned for the next few months at our network. So our next webinar is going to be Derek Mowbray talking on the 7th of March. He's uh, going to discuss well-being and the performance agenda. Derek is a psychologist. Uh, he specializes in preventing stress and building resilience in the workplace. This is followed on the 18th of March by a face-to-face -face full day on fire safety. This is being run jointly with the fire risk management group at IOSH. It's being hosted by the SBB, which is the Swiss Railroad, at their facility in Alton. Um, what we're going to look at in the morning, we have um, some interactive presentations on emergency planning, uh, particularly looking at how effective your existing systems are and how you could respond in different scenarios. And then in the afternoon, we have a demonstration. And um, I understand their facility is really impressive, so it should be a good one to come to. Okay, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Sharman. Andrew is a best-selling author, consultant, public speaker. Um, he has a new book out, um, and he has uh, developed this after 10 years of research, working with Dame Judith Hackett, who used to be the chair of the HSE, and he's going to share some of the learning from that with us today. Andrew lives in Switzerland, so we lay a bit of claim to him, um, but has a very international outlook, and. I mean, you can find him all over the world if you look at his, uh, his CV. It's, it's very impressive. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everybody. I'm trusting that you can hear me. It's always a daunting process when you start a webinar and uh, can't see people's faces. But hopefully you can, uh, you can hear me and very shortly you'll be able to see me also. I'm Andrew Sharman and I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to shortly be talking to you all about executive leadership and safety culture. But before I do, uh, just a couple of quick comments before I get right in. Um, as Ben said, if you've got questions during the session for me today, you can write these in using the chat option, uh, which you can find at the top of your screen. So, uh, so, so please do feel free to, to jump in with any comments or questions as you go. We have a lot of participants on this, uh, this webinar, more than 250 people. So if, the, uh, if there are too many questions, I'll commit to, to writing written answers and, and we can get those to you via email or perhaps published online. So, uh, so with that said, let's, uh, let's get moving. You have the, the benefit of, of one of us here on this uh, call, Dame Judith Hackett, my, uh, my colleague here at RMS and co-author of the book, Mind Your Own Business what your MBA should have taught you about workplace health and safety is unable to be here today. She's working with clients on another project. Um, the book is, as Alison has suggested, the, the culmination of 10 years of, of work and research 
Between Judith and I, her in her former role as chair of the health and safety executive, the British workplace safety regulator, uh, and also as, as a partner in my business, uh, and my work as, uh, as a consultant working with organizations around the world. My business, RMS Switzerland, as Alison says, is, is based here in Switzerland. Our focus is on organizational culture and enabling excellence for organizations like these, some of the people that we're currently working with, uh, a large number of, of, of global multinationals. We have offices here in Switzerland where I'm talking to you from, also in Germany and the UK, and, uh, and, and we'd, love to, uh, we'd love to say hi. So if you'd like to get in touch, please drop us a note, team at rmsswitzerland.com. I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, here on this webinar, I'm actually preaching to the choir. I wonder how many operational or line managers we have on this webinar. And I wonder how many health and safety professionals, practitioners or managers we have. I don't want to tempt fate, but I suspect that the majority of people on this webinar today are in the second category. And whilst this is great that there's lots of practitioners interested in thinking how to make a real difference in leadership and culture change in organizations, it highlights the size and scale of the challenge indeed, that it's difficult to get operational managers thinking about safety, let alone spending time working on it or doing something in it. Why is that? I, I guess I have some answers, which I'll share with you in this webinar today, but I'd love to hear what you think too. During this webinar and afterwards, you could share your thoughts about the challenges of getting leaders to engage on workplace health and safety on Twitter, using our Twitter handle, Armar Shaman, and also the Ayash Tweets Twitter handle, and that's a, an underscore, Ayash underscore tweets. And if you put hashtag mind your own business, then we'll all be able to see the, uh, the chat as it, as it takes place on Twitter. So I hope that you join in there. So mind your own business, it's the name of this new book, but really it's not quite a message for you. If you fall into that second category of health and safety practitioner rather than operational leader, what Judith and I would really like is for you to somehow get this message to reach your leaders. As Ben said at the start of the webinar, it's being recorded, so perhaps there's an opportunity for you to share this video with leaders in your organization after today. I guess this picture immediately makes you think of the children's fairy story Goldilocks and the three bears, or for those of you thinking in French, les boucles d'or. The story of Goldilocks is a simple one, isn't it? Uh, notwithstanding that she breaks into a house that doesn't belong to her in the middle of a forest, the story really come, comes together as she sits on a chair that's first too hard, and then a chair that's too soft, too comfortable. She tries some porridge, one bowl is too hot, the next is too cold, and then finally she finds one that's just right. And I wonder whether Goldilocks, in fact, is a useful metaphor for us in the world of workplace health and safety. Sometimes we find that safety at work is too hard, too many rules, too much bureaucracy. Sometimes it's too soft, not enough structure, not enough framework, not enough guidelines. So the question is, how do we get safety and health at work just right? That's what I'm gonna to try to help you answer as we move through this webinar. But first, what happens when it's not just right? What does that look like? Well, when a workplace safety culture is not just right, people fail to follow the important rules for their health and safety at work. Or worse, they comply with rules even if they're wrong or don't make sense. In our consulting work, we hear a lot of operation, uh, uh, operational leaders saying the rules are too difficult to understand. And when you drill down to shop floor level, the operators tell us the rules are too difficult to understand for us too. So we make shortcuts and work around. In some organizations, employees tell us we comply with the rules even though they don't make any sense. We just work to rule because if we don't, we get blamed for not following them. These are both challenging cultures that we need to dig into. But perhaps worse than that is the overconfidence and complacency that things just don't go wrong around here, that accidents that happen won't happen here or can't happen here because 
we have experienced staff, because we have great managers and leaders, or because we haven't had an accident for a while. In some organizations today, when things are not just right with regard to health and safety culture, often people don't speak about it. People make mistakes, have accidents, and then don't tell people because they have a fear of embarrassment or being blamed. Or perhaps in cultures that are not just right, managers and leaders fail to see the bigger picture about what health and safety really is and what their role is in leading health and safety at work. So to that takes us then to the next challenge, something that we call the leadership crisis. In short, we are deeply concerned about the quality of leadership in organizations around the world today. And, and here's why. 34% of employees in the UK currently describe their boss as a poor leader. This data comes, by the way, from a government task force survey in the United Kingdom. I'm going to supplement it with some other similar governmental task forces from around Europe, America, and a global study from Mercer, the HR consulting firm, where they surveyed more than 400,000 organizational leaders. Luckily for us, though, we're not in the UK. We're here in Switzerland, so the situation is hopefully different. In America, the picture of leadership isn't impressive either. 70% of American workers say their boss doesn't provide a clear picture of what great performance looks like. Good news, we're not in the States then. But around the world, including here in Switzerland, nearly one in every two workers feel disconnected from their leaders. 70% don't trust their managers and only 24% of employees around the world are actively engaged in the workplace. Now, if you take that last statistic and flip it on its head, what it really says is up to 76% of employees around the world are either not that bothered or worse, potentially actively disengaged. This is a challenge for leadership more broadly around the world. What happens though when we put health and safety into the mix? Do you think that these statistics get better, they improve? I suspect not. Health and safety for many of us as practitioners and as leaders is a challenging subject that's dogged with negative stigma and negative press that makes it difficult for us to communicate clearly and effectively. In our book, Mind Your Own Business, Judith and I have collated a bunch of quotes that have inspired our thinking. And I want to share one with you here by Albert Einstein, who said a new kind of thinking is essential if we're to survive and move towards higher levels. I think if we want to move towards higher levels of safety culture and safety performance, new thinking is absolutely paramount. In the book, we share five keys to health and safety excellence, and I'd like to share a couple of them with you in this webinar. The first one is this, that excellent health and safety performance requires constant active engagement. Let's think about health and safety performance for a moment. I guess this chart will look familiar to you, a lost time injury rate chart or LTI chart. There's various connotations of this, of course, TRIR, TRIFR, AFR, the abbreviations go on, but the data essentially presents the same story. Over a period of time, in this case, we could say seven years or seven months, accident rates, in this case, lost time injury rates, have reduced month on month. There's an exception, the fourth month there at 3.7, there's a small rise, and perhaps a practitioner might explain that that was because we were short staffed during that month because there was a, a larger customer order or pressure on the organization that caused us to take the eye off the ball a little bit. As Judith and I have sat in board meetings and leadership team meetings with our clients around the world, we hear the presentation of this data go something like this. The health and safety practitioner steps up and says, here's the last seven months data. As you can see, we've improved month on month except for this little blip of 3.7. That's under control now, and you see that we're reducing our accident rate month on month further and further to 2.2 currently, which is our best accident rate that we've ever had in the history of our organization. At this point, one of the leaders in the audience says, okay, that's good. 
And then what's said? How does the discussion ensue? Or what we hear are leaders saying, that's good, keep going, get to zero. And then what do they say? That's, what, that's right, that's the sound we hear too. Leaders often get stuck at this point and don't know what else to say other than keep going, get closer to zero. We're concerned about this because this is not an LTI chart. It's an LGI. It's a looking good index. And for far too many organizations today, when presented with this data, organizations look at it and say, ah, looks good, keep going. This self-congratulation leads to overconfidence and complacency. And those two things, I believe, are the root causes of many accidents for many organizations around the world today. Back in the 19th century, the biologist John Lubbock said, what we see depends on what we look for. And so true it is when we look at safety performance. Let me give you a case in point. At 11 o'clock in the morning, senior leaders arrive on this oil platform to celebrate seven years without a lost time injury. A formidable achievement and one which was celebrated by everybody on the platform. A few hours later, the leaders leave and you know what happens next. Boom! An explosion kills 11 people and seriously injures 17 others in one of the worst environmental disasters of our lifetime. I bet many of you now are immediately thinking, ah, Deepwater Horizon, Macondo, Gulf of Mexico. Do you remember the organization involved? Yep, that's right, BP. In fact, five years after Deepwater Horizon's explosion, BP's share price had not yet recovered to the price it was the day before the explosion. A devastating consequence for BP, not just in terms of loss of life, but loss of revenue, value, and market share. What Deepwater Horizon has proved is that the absence of accidents does not mean the existence of safety. The absence of accidents does not mean the existence of safety. Seven years without a lost time injury does not mean everything was safe and under control, as the accident proved. In fact, when you dig into the inquiry surrounding that failure, it's clear that safety concerns took a backseat to the pursuit of the remarkable returns available offshore. As the US National Commission co-chair said, there was not a culture of safety on that rig. So this is not just about how we think about performance, but also how we think about culture. Indeed, this is the second key to safety excellence, that leaders' visibility and genuine interest in safety are the things that drive cultural maturity. When I talk about leaders here in this webinar, I'm really meaning the operational leaders, from your chief executive, board, and senior leadership teams, rolling right down through the hierarchical operational leadership. That's really who this webinar is aimed at. If you're a health and safety leader, responsible or charged with driving health and safety as a technical discipline or as a department in your organization, these keys also apply to you. So as I share these keys, I wonder if you might like to question your visibility and how you display your genuine interest and how you encourage other leaders to do the same. So let's talk for a moment about culture. What exactly is it? In one of my earlier books, From Accidents to Zero, I, I talk about some research done back in the 1940s that identified over 150 different definitions of the word culture. In fact, I think there's still a culture quagmire today. It's challenging to deliver a definition that makes sense for everybody. And so easy it is to drift back to the most simplistic definition that culture is the way we do things around here. For the purposes of this webinar, I'd like to propose an alternative definition. That safety culture is how leaders lead safety and how followers behave and take action as a result. 
either supported by or resisted by the prevailing organizational culture. Let's just think about that for a moment. Safety culture is how leaders lead safety and how followers behave and take action as a result of that leadership. Crystal Wise, the lady on the left side of the screen, was an employee in a factory with many years of service, regarded as a fantastic operator by her colleagues and her leaders. She knew pretty much everything there was to know about the process she was operating. In September 2014, there was a release of the chemical methyl mercaptan at her factory in Laporte, Texas, United States, which caused Crystal to be overcome by the chemical. She collapsed on the floor of her workplace and died. Her colleague, Robert Tisnado, found her lying there and went into the room to try to save her and help. Despite the alarms sounding, Robert went to try to help his colleague. Like Crystal, he was also overcome by the chemical and collapsed and died on the floor. Robert's brother, Gilbert Tisnado, was working on the other side of the site. He understood that there was an alarm ringing in the area where his brother worked. He went there to try to see if his brother was okay. And like his brother, was overcome by the chemical and collapsed and died on the floor next to him. Wade Baker, a veteran employee with many years of service, regarded as a bit of an oracle on this site, a real expert in the work that he did, was the fourth tragedy on that day. Wade, like his three colleagues, was overcome with methyl mercaptan and died in his workplace. The workplace they were working at was celebrating many, many weeks without a lost time injury. In fact, it was at a site regarded for many years as being one of the safest around in one of the world's safest corporations. Rafael Morerasmo, the chairman of the US Chemical Safety Board said, what we're seeing here is definitely a problem of culture in the corporation of DuPont. You see culture, how leaders lead and how followers behave as a result of that leadership is one of the things that we talk about as being important to generating excellent safety performance. But one of the things that's perhaps one of the hardest to get right. I was recently chairing a Congress on environment, health and safety. And one of the speakers was talking about the importance of management and leadership. And when I asked him the question, what's the biggest thing leaders need to focus on? He said, soft skills, and then added very cleverly, but soft skills are often the hardest to learn and get right. So when it comes to creating your own health and safety culture, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Some organizations say safety and health. Some say health, safety and environment. Some abbreviate to HSEQ or SHEC. Some talk about safety and well-being or operational integrity or operational risk. A large consumer goods retailer that we work with talks about people risk, doesn't use the phrase health and safety. Another automotive manufacturer talks about total quality and includes health and safety within that badge. You see, I wonder whether if we want to create a different culture around health and safety at work, we might do well by thinking about the connotation surrounding the words health and safety. This is a challenge for me. As president-elect of IOSH, I'm thinking carefully all of the time about what our profession looks like, sounds like, and comes across like. It's difficult to change the words that we use when we communicate on the topic of health and safety. But there's not a reason that we shouldn't. It's up to us what we call the work that we do in our organizations. So perhaps ponder a little bit about the words health and safety and how they're received in your organization, in the spheres of influence that you have. Perhaps by aligning health and safety with broader operational risk or integrity or operational excellence, perhaps that makes it easier for people to engage with you to feel as if they can talk about it a bit more. And so to our third key, great safety culture is built on leadership involvement and focus. One of the things we hear from the most senior leaders in organizations we work with 
is that they're committed to health and safety, but sometimes they're just not quite sure what it is they can do. One of the things that we ask leaders to do when we're working with them that really extends the previous key about safety being a product of genuine interest of leaders is to ask them why safety is important to them. It's a big question and often it's easy for leaders to answer with what they believe is the right thing to say. Just yesterday when I asked a senior leader why is safety important to them, she responded by saying, because people are our greatest asset here in this organization. Her colleague said, because safety's first, it's our top priority in this business. These answers feel more like spin, like poster slogans, than a real explanation of why safety is important. 22 years ago, when I started out in safety, as a young apprentice moving from engineering into safety, my first job, my first day at my new job was picking up the severed fingers of a left hand. In a metalworking company where I had started working, the employee had removed the guard from a, a foot operated guillotine. He pushed the sheet of metal in too far whilst having a conversation with his colleague. His foot hit the switch, the guillotine came down and chopped off all four fingers from his left hand and the tip of his thumb. I got there after he'd been taken to hospital. I didn't really know what to do, to be honest. I picked up the fingers and put them in a plastic bag, got some ice from the canteen and drove to the hospital with them, wondering if they could be stitched on and repaired somehow. It was too late. It wasn't possible. This man in his mid thirties, married with two young children, the only income generator of his family had lost one of his hands. The doctors couldn't save it. That was a formative moment for me. One reinforced a few years later when I came to the scene of my first fatal accident. It's a story that sometimes I share with people that I work closely with today. These are the reasons that safety is important to me. On top of this, I've come to learn over the last couple of decades that safety is important to me because I'm frustrated with the negativity that surrounds our profession. I believe we do such good work as practitioners, advisors, officers, and managers of health and safety to help people go home without harm every day from the organizations that we work in around the world. I think the work that you do is so vitally important that it's become a big part of the why safety means what it means to me today. This question, I challenge you to ask it to yourselves. See if you can really think hard about why safety is so important to you. And then ask yourself a second question. How often have you really shared that with the leaders in your business? Do they really know why safety is so important? Or do they just think you do safety because it's your job? And now the second step, take this question to your leaders. Ask them why safety is important to them. You'll need to be brave here, a little bit of courage. Step up and challenge their answers. If you think what you're hearing as a response is spin or rhetoric, push a little harder, respectfully and gently, of course. But see if you can help your leaders dig deeper as to what's really inside their hearts as well as inside their heads. <clears throat> Last year, I was watching a great show on Netflix called Lie to Me features one of my favorite actors, Tim Roth. He plays a psychologist called Dr. Cal Lightman. Cal Lightman is hired by American police forces to help them solve crimes that are otherwise unsolvable. You see, Cal Lightman specializes in the psychology of lying. The police bring Lightman in and pretty quickly he works out exactly what's the truth and what's the lie. Now, when you ask that question to your leaders, why is safety important to you? You won't need Cal Lightman's help. You'll know instinctively whether it sounds authentic and genuine. And this is really important because your employees don't need Cal Lightman either. They know when they smell something that's untruthful coming from the leaders. 
they sense and feel authenticity and genuineness as well as you or I can. It's too easy to come up with rhetoric and slogan in health and safety at work. We've really got to strip things back. If we want to help leaders mind their own business, they've got to start by being more authentic. So let's take a lead here from the writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Douglas Adams says, to give real service, you must add something that can't be bought or measured with money. And that's sincerity and integrity. You see, to create your own health and safety culture in your organization, think about what fits there. Try to work out the hallmarks of your culture. What are the values, the artifacts, the rituals? What are the behaviors and the attitudes that prevail? And then see if you can work out how you can align your health and safety messages with that broader business culture. If it doesn't fit with your organization, with your people, it won't be just right. Conversation and dialogue are important. All too often in health and safety, it's easy to give information rather than communication. We need to find ways of encouraging more dialogue between people at every level in the organization. Last week, I was in a town hall meeting where the CEO talked about safety. At the end of the 20 minutes, he said, thank you very much and left the room. No questions, no discussion. As I watched the audience of workers who had taken 20 minutes off from the factory process lines, they seemed to be in disbelief as they sat there shrugging their shoulders and wondering if he was gonna come back onto stage like rock bands do for an encore and then take their questions. He didn't. I think it was an important moment missed. Of course, in health and safety, we need to design management systems and frameworks and policies and procedures to help structure the way that we do safety at work. But please be clear that paperwork and systems only work if they're designed well and prompt people to think and use them. What are the health and safety management systems and documentation systems like in your organization? If we asked your employees and managers today, would they say there was too much, too little, or that you've got it just right? Would they say they're easy to understand, difficult to understand, or just right? Perhaps it's time to think about those questions in your organization today. Sometimes in health and safety, I've noticed over the years that it can be quite a lonely place. Practitioners, may feel isolated from the rest of management or leadership within the business, often in an office at the end of the corridor or on a different floor to the other managers or leaders. That makes it hard to engage those leaders in health and safety. But in fact, that's key to success in creating a great health and safety culture. You've got to involve those who have got a stake in achieving the success. That means the managers and leaders at all levels. Okay, so let me give you the fourth key then for creating health and safety excellence. I'm alluding to it in the previous slide that safety improvement really needs to be a daily activity for everyone, not just you as the health and safety professional, not just the senior leaders, but everybody. It needs to be woven into everybody's role. After all, it is everybody's responsibility, right? So there can be no exceptions. I wonder what it is that you do to make sure it's integrated to everyone's role. Lots of organizations tell people to be safe and think that that's an extension of responsibility, but it's not. We need to create clear actions and define behaviors for what we want people to be doing. Don't hold on to this responsibility. If you're a health and safety practitioner on this call, health and safety is not your responsibility. You're charged with sharing it, with ensuring that people take accountability for themselves and others for really driving that change. So hand it out generously. Show your love here. Get people involved in health and safety with you. You know, here's the thing. There's so many people in your organization who have great views and good ideas, but really, do they have a voice? And is anybody really listening to them? What mechanisms do you have in place for listening to your employees, for asking them what they think about improving health and safety at work, 
for asking them questions about the things that really matter, the culture, the behaviours, the leadership, the engagement opportunities. Sure, I know you may have some suggestion schemes or some cards that people can fill out, but that's not really dialogue. That's information sharing. How do you build dialogue and good communication and conversation with your shop floor employees, the ones at the coal face who really understand how things work? When was the last time you invited someone to have a cup of coffee with you and just chat about what they think about safety? You know, health and safety culture needs to be promoted up and down the supply chain. That means within the organization and external to it too. The best in class organizations are the ones that seek to influence suppliers and customers too, designing risk out at every step, not trying to resolve and fix things after something bad happens. I'm conscious that I'm sharing lots of ideas here in this presentation. And what I wouldn't want you to do is think that there's lots more things that you need to add to your list and the list that you're creating of things to do is getting bigger and bigger. You know, sometimes it's about doing less in order to get more. Less visibility in some ways, less signage for safety, less rules could actually be more helpful so long as you embed what it is you want into your organizational culture and it's truly owned and led by the line managers and leaders. The American writer and poet Walt Whitman said, we convince by our presence. And this is absolutely true in health and safety. We need to get out there more. I've talked in this presentation about the importance of visibility, focus and commitment doing those things every day. Someone that got that right was Paul O'Neill, the former CEO of Alcoa and former US Treasurer too. O'Neill pulled Alcoa together and turned it into a mega successful organization, rising net income from 200 million to 1.5 million during his leadership. How did he do it? Well, his very first day on the job at Alcoa O'Neill called a town hall meeting for leaders and the media. He began by explaining that his strategy for growing Alcoa business and driving an excellent culture was to focus on one thing. That one thing, safety. You could Google his opening address and find a video of it on, uh, on the internet. I encourage you to do that. It's incredibly inspirational. But what was O'Neill's strategy? As the CEO of a huge multinational business, what was it that he actually did to drive that step change? Well, it was remarkably simple. Every day, O'Neill, wherever he was, in a factory, on a shop floor, in a leadership team meeting, with suppliers or customers, asked one question. His question was, what one small thing could you do today to improve safety around here? He asked it constantly through the procurement process, through the supply chain, through the customer base, around every shop floor that he visited and within every management team. It sounds simple, but O'Neill in his biography talks about the impact of it. Senior leaders asking questions like this and encouraging people to take accountability and action for themselves started to drive a step change in culture and performance that radicalized the way that safety was in Alcoa? It's a fantastic question and one that's immensely powerful today when we share it with leaders that we work with. You can try asking it too. A few weeks ago, I was on a construction site here in Switzerland. It looked reasonably safe. But when I asked this question to the workers there, there were three or four suggestions. First, they started with big answers. Well, we could completely re relay this out. We could change vehicle routes. We could do this. There were stacks of great big ideas. I encouraged them to think smaller. And they tried again with new ideas. And I said, no, think smaller. What's the smallest thing we could do right now that would help improve safety just a little bit? Each of the five men I was talking to came up with one small thing and agreed to go and do it. I went back to the site a week later and within minutes, two or three people came up to me saying, I've got a suggestion for what we could do about safety here. The power of these small questions can be immense. It just takes a bit of courage to try asking them sometimes. The Tati Ching, the 
ancient philosophical wisdom says, complete the difficult whilst it's still easy. Accomplish the great task by a series of small acts. These small acts could be those small questions like Paul O'Neill's question. What's the one thing you could do to make a difference in safety here today? Here's a few more questions you might like to try. If I were working with you today, what would I need to know in order to work safely with you? What's the most likely thing to injure you here? What could we do to make this an even safer place to work in? Or at the end of the day, you can ask how safe was it here today? And why was that? What did we do that made you feel safe? Or similarly, what did we do that kept everyone safe here today? These questions, open-ended as they are, stimulate thinking and hopefully some discussion too. You could use them on their own or as part of a dialogue in safety. You see, the lowest standard that you demonstrate as a leader is the highest standard that the organization can expect. I'm quite interested in magic. Over the last few years, I guess I've graduated from classical British magicians like Tommy Cooper and Paul Daniels to these new modern musicians like Dynamo and Howard Thurston. And Thurston says, long experience teaches him that the crux of his fortune is whether he can radiate goodwill towards the audience. I like this idea. I wonder whether goodwill is missing in health and safety. I wonder what we can do as practitioners to make managers and leaders feel like we're on their side. We're part of their team. We're a true business partner with them. Thurston reckons there's only one way to do it, and that's to feel it. As a great magician, Thurston says, you can fool the eyes and minds of the audience, but you can never fool their hearts. This, for me, points back to this idea of authenticity. Getting back to what matters most, connecting your why safety is important to you with the leaders and managers why of why it's important to them. It doesn't matter the size of your organization. Zara is asking, well, how do we do this in small and medium enterprises? And the answer is the same way. Finding out what matters most to your managers and leaders, asking them why safety is important, analyzing the culture of your small or medium sized enterprise and thinking clearly about how you align your work as a practitioner with that. I invite you to think about other small questions. What other small questions could you ask? We invite you to tweet your small questions that you can ask to improve your health and safety culture using these two Twitter handles, Amar Sharman and at Ayosh underscore tweets with the hashtag mind your own business. And we'll reward the best questions that you tweet with a copy of our book, Mind Your Own Business. So if you'd like a copy for free, get tweeting your questions today. At the end of the day, we'll share a book with each of you that has the best questions. So look, let's bring this towards a close and get ready to discuss your questions. Remember that you can add your questions to the chat box, which you can find at the top of the screen. Click on the more button if it's not displayed already and you'll find chat there. What have I been saying in this webinar? Well, safety is for everybody, everywhere, no exceptions. Small, medium, large, global, multinational, any industry. There are no exceptions. The principles are universal, but you've got to apply them with proportionality. Zara's question around how do we make this work in smaller, medium sized enterprises is absolutely right. You just scale up or down using these principles that I've given you. How do you do it in the procurement process, Stuart Hawkins asks. Well, in the same way, extending this genuine, authentic approach, an inquisitive approach that uses questions to engage people and use their skills and their knowledge to help you solve these challenges. Lessons can be learned from anywhere from within your, your procurement process, within your supply chain, within your organization, and from any industry sector. Our clients tell us one of the advantages that we offer to them is that we present views from different industry sectors, from different countries around the world. 
Last year, I worked in 54 different countries around the world. And in my career over the last 20 years, have been in 123 different countries. I know that there are cultural challenge and nuance in every one of those. Even in countries that we think are very similar, for example, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, both speak the same language, but culturally are quite different. Here in Switzerland, I'm talking to you from just outside Geneva, we speak French in this part of the country. When I work in France, teaching at the business school at, at INSEAD or, or working with French clients, I also speak French. But people often tell me I speak Swiss French or French with a Swiss accent, or I use words that are Swiss French and not French French. So these nuances and challenges are quite exciting if we're prepared to dig in. Whatever you do, it needs to be done in the context of really focusing on what it is that works in your organization. So think about that context, societally and organizationally, particularly if you're a practitioner coming from that one nationality, working in another nationality or different sector or different culture. One of my favorite quotes comes from Aristotle, who says, excellence is not an act, but a habit. What he's really saying here is that there are no silver bullets. There's no magic dust that suddenly creates safety excellence in your organization. It's something that we have to do every day, habitually, ritualistically, building these new ideas, these keys into everything we do. It might start with just one small question every day. Why not choose one of the questions that I've shared with you here and then ask that every day? Do it for the next seven days and see what happens. Then come back and reassess. You drop me a line and tell me how you're going if you'd like. So I started this webinar 45 minutes ago asking you what it was we needed to do to get things just right. The challenge is not too little, but not too much. Finding the balance in policy and procedures, in leadership and commitment, in advice and direction. You've got to do health and safety at work for the right reasons. The success of your business depends on it. Your integrity and that of others around you and the productivity of your business. There's stacks of research now that shows that organizations with good safety at work have good levels of productivity, quality, employee morale, low levels of sickness, absence, and so on. But still many organizations are doing safety for fear of being caught, for fear of receiving penalty, or because someone's telling them that there's a rule or a law that needs to be complied with. These are not the right reasons for doing health and safety. What are your reasons? Reflect on those a little bit and see whether they align to the reasons of your organization too. That's key if we want to integrate health and safety <clears throat> into the management of your business. Health and safety is never an add-on. For too long, it's been that thing that we do because the Lord tells us to. And I think it's time to reposition it as an enabler of great business, as an enabler of excellence, as an improver of culture, not just something to tick a box. In order to do that, it needs to be led from the top, the very top, the president, the CEO, the chairman, cascading down through the board and leadership teams and ex-coms and ex-co's in a way that engages and encourages people to feel empowered and to feel enabled as you create an evolution in safety culture in your organization. In this session, I've introduced five keys to safety excellence from our book, Mind Your Own Business, what your MBA should have taught you about workplace safety culture. I've shared four of them with you in this webinar. The first, excellent safety performance depends on constant active engagement at all levels. The second, leaders' visibility and genuine interest is the thing that drives cultural maturity and safety. Thirdly, great safety culture is built on top tier involvement and focus. And finally, safety improvement must be a daily activity for everyone. So I've got four questions for you 
the attendees of this webinar. How do you talk about and present safety performance in your organization? Here's perhaps the first piece of reflection you might like to do after this call. Second, how do you and your leaders get visible and show genuine interest in safety? Now, take note, I say genuine interest. I don't mean telling people that safety is important for the business. I mean digging a bit deeper and answering that why is safety important question. The third question is how's your safety culture defined and identified? I'm sorry if this is a, a little tricky in its wording. What I'm really meaning is have you ever asked your organization what does safety culture mean to us here? Have you ever created a definition of safety culture for your organization? And how do you know what that safety culture looks like? If I were to work in, walk into your site, plant or offices today, what would be the things that I would notice visibly and less tangibly? I might just feel. What would it be that I would be able to, to recognize as the hallmarks of your safety culture? And how do you amplify those? Or how do you turn down the volume on them too? And then finally, how do we make it easier for people to actually do safety each and every day? What are the opportunities that you share with your colleagues in your work at all levels to make it easier for them to be safe and to go home without harm every day of their lives? Mark Twain, the writer, said, time and tide wait for no one. And this reminds me of the importance of just getting on with things. You've had almost an hour of reflection and thought here in this webinar. What is it that you're going to do differently today as a result of spending this time? I can see that there's a bunch of questions coming in now, so I'm gonna turn over to those in, in just a moment. Before I do that, I'd like to extend a, a special IOS Switzerland offer to you if you'd like a copy of the Mind Your Own Business book or indeed any of our other books, From Accidents to Zero, Working Well, Safety Savvy, or any of the others, you can find them at fromaccidentstozero.com. If you use the code CURIOUS20, you'll get 20% off any of the books that you buy. Uh, I hope that you enjoy that and, uh, and, and do, uh, do manage to get hold of one of those books. So let's, uh, let's look then at these questions. I'm going to take these from the top. If you've got other questions just now, feel free to, to ask them as we go, and I'll pick off as many as I can until 11 o'clock. So we have about 10 minutes. Steve Pessina says, just right is a movable target influenced by existing culture and leadership motivations. It's sometimes difficult to see the next mountain top in the journey when you're in a valley, and so the process has to be phased and pertinent for the stage of the journey the organization is in, recognizing that different pockets of maturity will exist even in small companies. Steve, you're exactly right. What, what a fantastic metaphor. You're right. It can be difficult to see that next mountaintop. But, you know, none of us have crystal balls. So we need to do the best we can with the visibility that we have. One way to help you see around the mountain that you're climbing and over the top of it is to engage a bigger ambassadorial army. That means getting more managers and leaders on your side, sharing your perspective for what safety is and what their role is in that. Because just like climbing mountains, we all have different speeds and paces. The way, Steve, that you climb a mountain may be faster than me, which means you're able to see over the top quicker than I. So too, it's the same in your team. There are some that will climb the mountain faster or slower than you. And that can really help us see what's coming next. Stuart Hawkins talks about health and safety never being in the procurement process. Yeah, you're right, Stuart. It's challenging to get it in there. How do you address it? Well, it starts with you having a conversation with whoever's in charge of procurement and working out what the challenges are for procurement in your organization, demonstrating with clarity what it is that you think you can offer to the procurement process in terms of increased value by getting safety right. One way to do that is to think that safer companies are more attractive to suppliers. Therefore, you're able to demonstrate to suppliers how seriously you take this. If your suppliers and clients are big organizations, they'll probably know that safer companies are more productive, more effective, and have higher levels of quality. So that might help you there. Uh, Steve Pacina comes back with a question. 
Having spin type answers to the question of why safety is important to you are surely appropriate when you're in a reactive state, but must change as we learn and develop through the journey to a proactive stance and beyond, using the ideas of genuine, heartfelt and personal dialogue. Yeah, I think you're right, Steve. Uh, you, need, you need to be appropriate to the part of the journey that you're on. A simple tool to think about this is the DuPont Bradley curve that talks about moving from one type of culture to another. So too it is, whichever model you use, whether it's the Bradley curve model or the model that we use in our business or any other model, including one that you might create yourself, you need to be appropriate to the point in that journey. Anyone that's interested in taking up running knows that you don't just put your trainers on and go off and run a marathon or an ultra marathon. You start with a kilometer and then a five kilometer race after a little bit of time and then a 10 kilometer race. Then you might do a half marathon and you build up and your training and your performance changes as you progress. It's the same in safety. Steve, you're also saying that long periods of LTI free operations mean a stronger focus on the less severe events and hazards is required. I partially agree with that. Um, you, you do need to be looking at the less severe uh, events and hazards. That means a stronger focus on near misses. You're right. But let's not take our eye off the ball of serious injuries and fatality potential. Those hypos also need to continue to be considered even if you're not having them. So it needs to be appropriate to the risk that you've got. So keep going back to your risk register and your risk assessments. Zara, you asked about small and medium enterprises, and I said, really, linking back to Steve Pacina's comment, it's about proportionality and finding what's appropriate. Uh, Cathy, you're asking how to deal with overconfidence. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a challenge, isn't it? And I'm sure all of us, including myself at times, fall prey to overconfidence. One of the things we can do is, is keep asking ourselves that question, why is safety important? Stripping it back to that and really reminding us that this is about people. I can't think of a better thing to get passionate about than the people that we're working with. Uh, Galaxy A5 2016, not sure that's their real name. Hi Andrew, what more can we do as health and safety practitioners if after steadily trying all these ideas just to get the leaders focus on safety and it's not working due to pressure on them to complete projects, particularly in construction? Well, Galaxy A5, if you really have tried everything that's in this presentation, I'm sorry I haven't given you anything new or any, any different perspective. I wonder, whether, I wonder whether it's about the leaders that you're working with or whether it's about the communications that you have uh, and the connection that you have with these leaders. If you're confident your connection and your communication is solid and effective, and you think you're just working with a bunch of leaders who just are not interested or will not get with it, Perhaps it's time to think about your role. It might not be the advice that you want, but that's what's in my head right now. Uh, Robert asks, <clears throat> do management boards get the wrong KPIs, i.e. incident statistics, because safety practitioners don't know what they should be measuring for safety performance? Yeah, Rob, I think you're right. For too long, we've been stuck in this rut of measuring KPIs that are basically around accident rates. There's a, a shift over recent years particularly in the last couple, to talk more about leading indicators. Uh, and also smart organizations are thinking about balanced scorecards. I'm not advocating here that you need to throw out LTI rates or AFRs. But that might be too much of a shock for many organizations. So you could keep those in there in your performance packs, but gradually start to move towards more leading indicators and talking about those with your leadership teams and boards. The only way we'll switch to being more proactive in our performance measurement and more real is by gradually getting towards some of those leading indicators. That might be tempting here for you to say to me, so what leading indicators should we use? Well, in my books, you can find plenty of examples, but I'm reluctant to give you some here because this is not about using the indicators that I think are good. It's about working out what it is that you want to measure in your organization. So before setting indicators, Think about the behaviors that you want to see more or less of, and then craft indicators that help you monitor and measure those specific things. Don't go crazy here. Pick two or three or four things that you want to focus on and then create those indicators. Remember, your indicators don't have to be set in stone. Just like Steve was saying, we need to adopt our approach for the different stage of the journey. So too with indicators, you can change your KPIs as you move along. Um, 
Hitesh, oh, we've got lots of questions coming in now. Hitesh says, in the UK, I've come across an attitude that as a health and safety advisor, you only advise. They don't take responsibility for the method of work. How do you address this? <clears throat> well, Hitesh, yeah, you can be an advisor and you can stand back and say, it's my advice. You choose if you want to follow it or not. Or you could be an enabler. You could be a partner. But it, to my mind, it doesn't matter what our job title is. The role of health and safety practitioner is to practice the right things and to enable success. Perhaps it's time for trying out how you act as a partner. Um, uh, okay, so some more questions uh, coming in. My goodness, we have lots and lots. I'm gonna continue on for a couple of extra minutes. I realize that we're scheduled to finish at 11, but I'm gonna try and get a few more of these. Um, I think what I might do is, is uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll just keep going with the questions. Michael Riedeker says workers new to the job or on temporary contracts may be less informed about occupational risks present and they will face limited bargaining power. What would you do to nurture a culture that addresses this issue? Yeah, Michael, you're, you're right. Um, but if workers new to your job are less informed about the risks, then that's a management failure in itself, isn't it? you've got to find ways to really get in there and, and help them see what they need to do. A solid risk register will help. Karen Duggan, how do you approach the ap apparent disconnect between facilitative trusted approach to HLS culture and light on its feet with the general system practical approach largely espoused by HSE, which is about documentation? Uh, the two might feel incongruous, but it's up to you, Karen, to get the balance right in your organization. What works? What is it that works for you? Think about the questions I've asked here and think about the leadership contribution within your business and then work out what feels right for you. Uh, Ken Stevens, you visited a new client yesterday as a consultant. Um, standards and culture is inadequate. But by whose standard, Ken? Yours or theirs? You carried out an audit and you're going back again. Um, the MD is old school, going to need all your powers. Any ideas for your feedback? Yeah. Take him a copy of the Mind Your Own Business book, Ken. Give it to him as a gift and tell him he only needs to read five pages. At the end of each of the five chapters, there's a one-page summary with a stack of questions that he can ask. It could be a great way to, uh, to do in your delivery. Um, anonymous, how do we address if some directors are neglecting health and safety, rejecting courses? Any tips for changing their mindset? Yeah, find out what it is that they're really worried about. Are they worried about the cost of the business? Are they worried about cost savings, value add? Are they worried about going to jail? What is it that you're gonna do? Uh, how does safety culture be implemented to construction workers? Uh, by finding what works for construction workers. I, I, my experience in construction is you, you've got to find out what's important to them. And I think every construction worker wants to go home at the end of the day. They also want to achieve their product, project on time without any downtime so they get their bonuses. So how can you think that health and safety can help people be more efficient, more effective, meet the time schedules? And the obvious answer is if you have a serious accident on a construction site, it stops the project. So having good levels of safety at work allows people to look out for each other, avoid having to stop the job for an accident. And in fact, when we look out for each other a bit more, we get more into what the psychologist Mihaly Sixcent Mihaly calls a state of flow, where things just get better and our performance improves. Robert Gazio says, how do you change the company's MD mindset that implementing health and safety is not affordable? Well, Robert, the stacks of research out there that shows that an investment of one euro, one dollar or one pound in health and safety brings a return on investment between four and 20 times that initial one euro. Your advice isn't mandatory. Uh, and, and, and just saying we're protecting people isn't enough. So work out a cost uh, of safety. Take the number of accidents that you've had in, in your workplace uh, and take an average cost of one of those accidents. Look at the World Health Organization or the ILO's websites or EU OSHA for the latest figures on average cost of an accident. Multiply that by the number of accidents you have in your business and get a total cost of those accidents. Then work out your profit margin for your organization. 
With those two data points, you can now work out how much extra revenue or extra sales your business needs to make in order to cover the cost of safety. Uh, Sam Sul Arafin, is there any guide what a good leader's question sounds like? I think I answered that with my questions. Um, Sam Sul, and you might find some more on Twitter with people tweeting their ideas too. Uh, Andrew Rippington, thanks for your great feedback, Andrew. Glad you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, reference too much paperwork in systems. What are your thoughts to the need for evidence in case of regulatory investigation? Yeah, good question. Hey, you know what, if we're just generating systems so that we've got evidence just in case, it sounds like an awful lot of time and effort doing that, which you could be spending on getting safety just right. You've got to balance it, Andrew. There's a requirement to have systems and, and uh, procedures, but that is not because it will become evidence. If Judith Hackett was on this call with me, she'd be quite upset about this question. She recognizes it as a challenge, but please stop creating paperwork and policies and systems just so you can stuff it down the back of your pants so that if you get kicked by a regulator, it doesn't sting so much. Instead, do the right thing. Make a difference to your business. Penilla Sorm, how do you measure the safety culture uh, without destroying the culture? There's a stack of organizations you can use that can do a culture assessment. It's one of the key things that we do in our business. Um, but you can start by asking some of these questions that we've given you here on, on this uh, session. So uh, that's it from me. I, uh, I'll just say thank you very much for, uh, for this great webinar. Thanks for your feedback and thanks for so many people joining. I'll hand over now to, uh, to Alison and let her wrap this one up. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was amazing. I love those questions coming so fast at the end. Uh, I think you can just take a deep breath now and go back to your, your cup of coffee. But I do think it shows the level of enthusiasm, <laughs> enthusiasm and interest in what you had to say. So really great webinar. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and for, for joining us today.